It is a very good morning now to the Dubbo Region Mayor, Matt Dickerson. Hello, how are you? Yeah, good, good. I would like to say to you that it was our very last council meeting last night, our 35th council meeting of this term of council, but one of the resolutions from council last night will require us to have another council meeting on the 5th of September. So it was almost our last council almost. meeting. What's, almost. What's the next meeting for? Well, there's a couple of things we've got to tidy up. So even though last night was scheduled to be the last council meeting, because of course now today we're in caretaker mode, which mm. has just got a few technicalities associated with it, there's a few things we need to sort out. One of those being the referral of our financial accounts through to the auditor. So that's pretty important to yeah. be done and needs to be done in a certain time frame. We've also got three DAs that we need to consider at council. If we don't consider them during this caretaker period, then really we're getting to October, towards the end of October, before they can be considered by council. And from a developer's point of view, every day costs money. We can't do that. And they could also go through the process of what's called a deemed refusal mm. because it's taken so long for that to come out. And at the moment, Brett, we've talked about it before, we're at the top of the league table for DA processing times. We don't want to wreck that. So no. 5th of September, we've got another meeting. It should be a fairly short one. Last night was fairly long, not that long, two, two and a half hours. Okay. So it had a reasonable length to it, but at the end it was quite nice. A few discussions from a few of the councils, including myself, just about our other councils and the good time that we'd had and the <laughs> wonderful friends that we'd made through this term of council. So yeah, got a bit soppy and emotional towards the end of it, but kind of our last council meeting. All right, sort of, but not yet. Um, tell me, with the election coming up, the September local government election, you've got a lot of people running, I uh, have heard this week. 48 are running, 48. which I think is good. I think that's mm. a good sign of democracy. Seven of the existing councillors are standing again, so good on all of those. And it'd be nice to see those seven return and then four new ones will come in. Again, you want people in the community that are focused on democracy, focused on delivering for the community. And the more you get stand, presumably the better quality field you get. All right, well, I guess we can't complain then because we've had enough <laughs> opportunity to say, and put your hand up to run. Caretaker mode really simple basic form for those people that have never heard of the term what happens you still run council we're still at councillors i've just mentioned we're still having a council meeting yep. in caretaker mode there's a few technical restrictions so for example you can't determine a da that's a controversial da and a controversial da is defined as one that's got more than 25 submissions associated with that DA. So that's one technicality. You can't go and sack the GM and hire a new GM, for example. That seems a reasonable thing not to do right before the end of a council term. Mm. There's a couple of technicalities in terms of binding decisions on councils, but I've just mentioned we're about to have a council meeting in a couple of weeks' time. Mm. We'll still do things that you would normally do in council, and council still needs to run. We still need to make sure things are operating. Caretaker mode really is just a way of making sure that some councillors don't try and do some silly things right at the very end of their term. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, fluoride update. There was a presentation last night. Tell me about this, because this is a, a long-running saga by the fields. That is a very nice way to put it, Brett. Long-running saga is exactly what it is. As you know, January 2019, fluoride stopped being put in the water because they had an issue with the dosing process. No one was told about it, the community wasn't told, so there was no communication about that and nothing was done to rectify it. When we came into council in our first year in 2022, we discovered there was no fluoride, we told the community about that and started taking action to fix that. So you would think surely putting in a new dosing system would be a reasonably efficient process. It's mm. not like there's no fluoride dosing across the nation. We engaged public works, we went through a process, we awarded a tender. But there have been some complications along the way, and there was a, a great presentation by one of our staff last night in terms of not great from the outcome, but great in terms of the details and the okay. information. But ultimately, what it means is we still won't have fluoride in our water until the end of January next year, end of January 2025. So that will mean from January 2019 to January 2025, no fluoride in our water. So Goodness it is gracious. frustrating and disappointing. Yeah, yeah. But it's frustrating and disappointing for you guys too at council, right? Well, Not we didn't even know us. about it when yeah. we were first elected. We didn't even know it was a problem for months after we were elected. Mm. Once we found the problem, it would have been not easy to do because it would have been very dishonest to do it but it would have been easy for us to do what the last council did and just said nothing about it but that was the wrong thing to do we told the community and we said we'll take action we're taking action it's just taking longer in my mind than i would like it to take but we've got experts on there working away on it and my job is to tell the community what's going on this is what's going on i don't have to love it 
but this is exactly the, the information is the information I'm telling the community the information the weight the length of weight ideally it's not good for us what is the reason behind that just quickly it, it really is a very complicated process to fit a modern fluoride dosing system in to a confined space because that plant, that water treatment plant was designed with a different fluoride dosing system. Okay. You've got a, a different way of doing fluoride dosing now. They believe there's a safer way to do it, a I better see. way to do it. So trying to fit that modern fluoride dosing into a plant that was built back around 2006, that's where some of the complication has been. That's essentially, that's a summary of a 10 minute presentation from one of our staff last night. Understood, all right. Uh, let's talk about the money owed uh, from Rex uh, Regional Express, uh, you know, to Dubbo Regional Council. That was revealed this week. And the figure is $658,000. What is that money for? That's money that we charge airlines for passenger fees. So when an airline lands and you've got passengers on board, we charge $19.45 per passenger. Mm. We've also got security screening, and security screening is charged slightly differently in that you we take an amount that we uh, charge for security screening, divide that by the number of passengers on a cost recovery basis. But that might be approximately, say, $6.60 per head. So round numbers, you might be paying about $26 for each time you land at the airport, about $26 goes to Dubbo Regional Council to pay for the operation and upkeep of the airport overall. So important, and the important part about that, Brett, is we don't want the community to be subsidising the airport. We want to make sure the airport operation funds itself. So that $658,000 is the amount that was owed by Rex at the time they went into administration. That had a longer time frame on those payments. Normally you'd expect some of our bills to be paid in those terms within 30 days. Mm. Rex had stretched it out somewhat, and that's usually a bad sign for a business anyway when they start stretching out how long they're taking to pay their bills. So the point that we're in administration, that's what's owed to us. I don't see us getting a lot of that recovered. Mostly when companies go into administration, you might get back five or 10% of what you're owed. So that money will get back as much as the administrators work out. The nice thing going forward though is the federal government came out yesterday, made an announcement that if you are wanting to fly Rex, they guarantee those tickets while it's being under or being run under administrators. So mm. essentially, you can buy a ticket right at the moment while administrators are running the company, you can buy a ticket and it's got a guarantee from the federal government that ticket will be on it. So if something else happens untoward down the track, then those tickets are still guaranteed by the federal government. All right, sounds like a debt that might have to be written off. At some point, there'll be a large amount of money that'll be written off, which will be bad, and obviously that hurts our bottom line. Mm. That money ultimately will probably have to come from general revenue. We can't just go and put our fees up at the airport to cover that. That would be unfair on other airlines, on other passengers. In that scenario, it is terrible for everyone. Many people have been involved in a business where it might have gone broken, people are left holding the can, and that's us in this case. All right, a few more things to get to. Tell me about the Northwest Precinct, because that was in the agenda as well. The first subdivision DA has been approved by council last night, 145 lot subdivision. Now this is exciting, Brett. That whole Northwest Precinct, when we got onto council, we started the planning process. So this is one of those nice things within this term of council, something started, we wanted to accelerate the whole process for that subdivision, all those different owners of that subdivision over there in the Northwest Precinct. Exciting area, we need more housing, we need more areas for people to live in Dubbo, people want to be here in Dubbo. So that's all exciting. So this is now as a result of all that planning, the accelerated planning, what we asked our staff to do and do in a short time frame, we've now got the real, the first real tangible result, which is that first 145 lot subdivision. So that's pretty exciting, Brett. All right, for those people that don't know exactly where that is, where, where will that uh, sort of be? So the Northwest Precinct is if you go along the Macquarie River in a northerly direction, mm -hmm. and if you keep going along there and then look to the west, so basically from Thompson Street, the Macquarie River, into that section there, that Northwest area from there, all that area in there, huge amount of housing, owned by a number of different owners in terms of that land, some by council, some by private developers. But the most exciting part about that, Brett, is that there's a huge amount of land there, but it's so close to the CBD. Many other land developments that are happening, say for example with Keswick, you're a long way away from the CBD, but that, all that land there, is incredibly close to the CBD, so it's an exciting area. Yeah, good. The REACT Centre out at Wellington was also on the agenda, and you have some good news by the sounds. I think some very good news with this. This is 
the $128.4 million the, the state government has allocated for some of the areas that are impacted via the energy transition. So this is the first res, as we know, the Central West Orana Renewable Energy Zone is the first one, and that encompasses essentially Warren Bungle, Midwestern and Dubbo, a little bit of Upper Hunter as well. That $128 million, the first $70 million of that was announced by Penny Sharp, the minister, when she was in town a few weeks ago. And so applications are opened now as we speak for different parts of that money. And that's spread up in different chunks. They've got different buckets in different areas. But essentially, council, to do some things, which I'll mention in a moment, we've got the ability to apply for $11.25 million. Mm. It really is about trying to work at ways we can use that money to build the economy, to build employment, to make a difference in the economy, not just to build something shiny, not just to build some new asset that might sit there and be nice for people to look at. Really, the government wants it to be ways that you can change the economy. And I believe that the whole res around Wellington will change their economy, but the REACT Centre, Renewable Energy Awareness and Career Training Centre, I believe that has the ability to fundamentally change the economy of Wellington for a couple of reasons. One, the training, we know there's 6,000 people needed over the next seven years for our res. But the second part of that is that I look at examples like the Parks Telescope, 100,000 people go through the Visitor Centre. Snowy Hydro Discovery Centre, 150,000 people a year. This REACT Centre, if we get it right, Brad, potential for 100,000 visitors a year. When you consider the zoo typically has 350,000, 100,000 to Wellington's economy does fundamentally change that economy. We're relying on a feasibility study, which is still out there at the moment. So mm. the resolution from council last night was to go ahead and put that funding application in pending the right outcome from that feasibility study, which is again being worked on as we speak. And on the 5th of September, I'm suspecting that I'll probably bring a mayoral minute forward to give us the final tick of approval on that. But at this stage, we've said to the staff, go ahead and start putting the application together for that application because they close on the 9th of September. Okay. So we've got to make a decision about that in Caretaker as well. Yeah, and I think you said on this program, wouldn't it be nice if this could change Wellington forever? I think was your words. And that's exactly right. I can't remember the exact words I said. That sounds pretty good. But what you want to do with any large project like this is not just change it while there's construction, you want to change it forever. And that Discovery Centre, that Visitor Information Centre, the REACT Centre, has the ability to change Wellington forever. Yeah, I love it. All right, Matt, uh, anything else of note before I let you go? No, just uh, again, my thank you to my fellow councillors. Thank you to Murray Wood, the CEO, and his staff just for being a, a very good, supportive council. I think we've achieved a lot in this term of council. There's no doubt about it that we have. I'm sure that we wouldn't be able to do that without a great team of councillors, without a great staff there. So thank you to all of those people. And of course, thank you to you, Brett. Thank you to 2 to you. It's great to be able to come along and talk every week on 2 to you to tell the community, keep the community updated mm. about exactly what's going on. So I appreciate the time you've given me every, each and every week. I think you and Murray and of course, Andy, what else that we've had from council on with your transparency as well, whatever might happen in the future, good luck. And I hope to continue to talk with council. Thank you, Brett. All right, have a good day. Matt Dickerson there, the Dubbo Region Mayor, right here at 2 to you.